Arkham Knight isn't just a game. It's the crescendo of a saga that captured the minds of gamers and comic book fans for years. It's the definitive ending to Rocksteady's take on Batman, no matter what happened afterward. As much as I've criticized the storytelling in Arkham Knight, I always thought it did a hell of a job sending off not just Batman, but his friends, enemies, and the world that had been built up since Arkham Asylum. And that's special. In our culture of entertainment where nothing seems to end, or end on its own terms, Arkham Knight did the unthinkable. It ended the unendable. So in this video, let's take a look at how Rocksteady capped off a trilogy that redefined an entire genre, explored the legacy of a character as iconic as Batman, and managed to craft the perfect farewell for their Dark Knight. Let's begin with the main villains, Scarecrow and the titular Arkham Knight, because they set the stage for this finale. It's their takeover of Gotham City that forms the skeletal structure for this game to explore its most important theme. Legacy. While this game is named after Jason Todd's villainous moniker, it could have just as easily been called Arkham Legacy, since both of these villains challenge the legend of the Batman and ultimately succeed in killing him. Scarecrow has an insane hard-on for wanting to destroy the public myth of the Batman, wanting to prove that he's just a man, capable of failure and susceptible to fear. He goes about this plan in the most ridiculously over-the-top way imaginable, but hey, the straw man deserves a bombastic plot every now and then. His goal is to motivate Batman through fear, break him with failure after failure, ruin his reputation as an unstoppable force, and tear away hope from all those who believe in him. At the end of the game, he unmasks Batman before the world to shatter the myth forever, putting a face and name to their terrified fallen hero. Of course, he only partially succeeds. Batman is unmasked, but overcomes his fears and defeats Scarecrow, demonstrating the human capacity for resilience to far more than just Gotham. Scarecrow did succeed in killing the Batman, but that's why Bruce has to create a new myth by the end, faking his death with the Nightfall Protocol and forging something different to carry his crusade into the future. By ending one legacy, Scarecrow fosters the beginning of another, one we're left to imagine for ourselves. Then there's the Jason Todd of it all. His connection to Batman's legacy is the most obvious. Batman's greatest failure, the fallen son, a bastardization of his crusade, twisted by the madness of his greatest enemy. In a game analyzing the legacy of Batman, Jason Todd had to be a part of it in some way. His design and methods show a cracked mirror version of what Batman could have become, a cold, calculating killer commanding obedient soldiers. His rage at Batman reflects Batman's own self-hatred, an embodiment of the guilt he feels for mistakes made throughout his career. The reveal that the Arkham Knight is a former Robin is a twist of the knife, but also signifies a spark of hope. Although Jason harbors all this hatred for Bruce, Bruce reaches out to his wayward son. His mission as Batman is not defined by irreversible failures. Through mercy and compassion, he is able to pull Jason from the brink. At once, the Arkham Knight represents Batman's greatest failure, but also the strength of his purpose, proving that Batman's legacy is not darkness. He is a path through darkness into the light of a better tomorrow. That is what the Arkham series chooses to do with its final big villains, and although there is one major villainous force I've neglected to mention, First, I want to hone in on how Rocksteady uses side missions and supporting characters to say goodbye to this series. This is the first and only Arkham game where the Bat family is featured in the spotlight. Although Oracle has been present since the beginning, Alfred joined in City where Robin also briefly cameoed, it's here that these characters are actually given something to do alongside other supporting players like Nightwing, Lucius Fox, and of course, Commissioner Gordon. Each character has their own moment to reflect on the importance of Batman, his impact on their lives, and say a type of goodbye to the character. Nightwing is introduced as the perfect example of what Bruce's mentorship had to offer. He's a hero in his own right, protecting his own city. He's what Jason Todd could have been if tragedy hadn't struck, and although Batman keeps Nightwing at a distance, it's clear he's proud of his first son and gets a chance to say goodbye to him, to verbalize what's previously been difficult, knowing the end is near. Lucius Fox and Alfred don't really have much to say outside of emphasizing the importance of Batman's mission throughout the game. Plus, Alfred disappears with Bruce at the end, presumably continuing to serve his dear friend in a new life, 
so no goodbye is really necessary for him. He's a package deal. On the flip side, the first quarter of the game is focused around saving Oracle. She's kidnapped to get at Batman and then kills herself because she's terrified of him. Of course, he blames himself for another member of his family being killed, one who had already paid a steep price. But when it's revealed she's alive, she eases Bruce's conscience with the most consoling advice any of his allies have to offer. She reminds him that Batman doesn't need to bear the weight of responsibility for his family. That they're not fighting for him, they're fighting with him. It's Robin and Commissioner Gordon who have the most tempestuous relationships with Batman. His lies and manipulations for their own good have caught up to him, and he's confronted with his failure to trust them as true allies which is what Barbara's advice was all about. Both Robin and Gordon are put through the ringer when Oracle is kidnapped. Batman chooses to tell Gordon, and then takes one on the chin as Gordon rushes off into danger. He then chooses to keep it a secret from Robin to avoid the same reaction. Gordon represents Batman's fears of betraying his allies' trust, and Robin represents how far Batman will go to keep his allies from knowing about his betrayals. When Oracle dies and Batman keeps it a secret, there was no going back. He was only able to tell Robin after he's locked him away, which is what puts him in even greater danger to be kidnapped by Scarecrow. Ultimately, he realizes his failures and has to sacrifice everything to atone. Meanwhile, Gordon is also able to forgive Batman for keeping Barbara's involvement a secret, realizing she was unable to resist fighting for a better tomorrow and Batman's crusade, just like he was. By the end of the game, he's willing to die by Scarecrow's hand rather than unmask the Batman and bring it all crashing down. While these characters do not know it yet, this is their last night with Batman, and each gets to say goodbye in their own way. But the game goes so far as to tell us a little bit more about where their lives go afterward. Barbara and Tim are married while Robin begins his solo career protecting Gotham. Gordon is running for mayor, Nightwing and Lucius have teamed up in a vigilante operation, and Jason has taken up crime fighting in his own way. The world goes on without Batman, but his influence and mission live on in each of them. They say a hero is only as good as their villains. Well, I submit that's true for the Arkham series as a whole. Over the course of four titles, this universe featured an expansive roster of foes for Batman to punch in the teeth. Of course, there are the mouthy henchmen that make the maps feel alive, but then there are the all-stars and the creeps, the mainstays and the one-offs, the villains that build the halls of the asylum, then terrorize the streets of Gotham, and a couple friendly faces who seem unable to stay out of their way. In crafting a fitting finale for the Dark Knight, Rocksteady made sure to engage players with final confrontations with the most iconic rogues gallery in comics, which feel satisfying and conclude ongoing storylines knowing which characters to humanize and humiliate one last time. Now, I'm not gonna go into every side mission. Who am I kidding? That's exactly what I'm gonna do. There are a couple mission types for these most wanted stories, ones where the villains are used to say something about Batman, ones that give Batman a chance for a last interaction with a significant character, and ones that wrap up existing story threads. I think it's so impressive that so much care went into fleshing out this game that nearly every side mission had some sense of finality to it. While playing, you can really feel the desire to deliver something special. Let's start off with the three side missions which introduce brand new villains. Deacon Blackfire, Professor Pig, and Man Bat. Even while introducing something new, this game still manages to instill some commentary on Batman's legacy or provide some closure for the franchise. Man Bat is a man turned into a monster by a serum who killed the person that trusted him the most. Throughout this entire game, Batman is infected with Joker's blood, and he's afraid he's gonna kill the people who trust him the most. The one difference, of course, is that Batman overcomes his transformation, while Kirk Langstrom wasn't as fortunate. It isn't very subtle, but Man Bat has always been used as an inversion of Batman, and I appreciated how he is used to reflect Batman's fears in the main plot. Professor Pig kidnaps broken people to mold them into his perfect vision. He calls himself Daddy in relation to his Dolotron victims. In a game that focuses so much on the Bat family, with a failed Robin as the titular villain, it's not hard to see the bizarre overlap in Batman and Pig. At least, I'm sure the Arkham Knight could make that argument. 
But at the end of the day, Batman celebrates his children's differences while Pig rejects them, casting out abominations on display. The ultimate irony being that it's those differences which led Batman to catch Pig. And then there's Deacon Blackfire, who has nothing really to say about Batman, but he facilitates a fond farewell to a recurring Arkham character, Jack Ryder. Ryder's been teased since Asylum, appeared in the opening to Arkham City, was nearly assassinated as part of Deathstroke's contract, and hosts Quincy Sharp on his radio show after the events of Arkham Origins, where Sharp proclaims his pledge to reopen Arkham Asylum. This buffoon has always been on the periphery, and it was just nice to see him involved in one more adventure. There are plenty of small moments like that for other reoccurring characters, although most aren't nearly sacrificed by a demented preacher. There are the riddles about Quincy Sharp and Bane, and Vicky Vale and Calendar Man are present at the Batman's death, fulfilling the promise made by Calendar Man's Easter egg in Arkham City. There are two more big loose ends from Arkham City that this game tackles, Azrael and Raish al Ghul. Both of these characters are all about the legacy of the Bat. One wants to replace him, and the other wants to be replaced by him. It was great seeing Azrael training under Batman as a potential successor, only to be too twisted to earn the cowl. But it was even better to see Raish's return. The mastermind behind the reopening of Arkham Asylum through the collapse of Arkham City on his deathbed at the mercy of his surviving daughter. The parallels between Nyssa and Jason aside, Bruce gets the chance to definitively deny Raish's request for succession. Also, I found it interesting that the two side missions that are the most closely associated with Batman's legacy are the only two where the player gets to make a choice. Have Azrael surrender to or attack Batman? Kill or arrest Raish? I don't think that was intentional, and I'm not sure what to read into it, but it's almost like the game was subconsciously telling us that although this may be Batman's end, there are plenty of interpretations for what that end means to different people. Or a person could be of two minds about the whole thing. Someone like Two-Face? Two-Face's inclusion definitely felt more like a mandate rather than anyone having a genuinely good idea for him. Like the decision to include him was a shrug. I feel that's how Penguin and Riddler were discussed as well. Despite technically being involved in the major plot, they really aren't. There's nothing brand spanking new done with these characters, but at least Penguin and Riddler show up in the main story. Two-Face doesn't even get that. However, what they did with Two-Face was a fine enough farewell. Arkham Batman never really interacted with him besides this iconic scene. Two guns, bitch! But the two don't even exchange one line between each other in the story of Arkham City. So although Harvey just retreads his origins and alludes to the long Halloween on an intercom, it was a way to harken back to the early days of Batman and one of his first failures. Plus, the dialogue if you catch Two-Face after the Batman identity reveal is a nice touch, with Two-Face commenting on the duality of Bruce Wayne. I think the Penguin and Riddler missions had a much greater impact. Somehow, Penguin gets an even shallower arc than Two-Face, but his omissions allow for the only Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson interactions in the entire series, spurring on Batman's heartfelt goodbye to his first son. Riddler does something similar, but at least he has an arc, and he definitely completes it. He's fully gone off the deep end, and I love his descent throughout these games. But the real star of the show here is Catwoman. I'm just a sucker for old Selina, and once she's freed, Batman gets his truest goodbye of the game. He finally kisses her and explains to her more of his post-Nightfall plan than he explained to anyone else. The Joker hallucinations even use Batman's visits to the orphanage to comment on his history with Catwoman and guilt over Talia, adding a greater sense of tragedy to his relationship with Selina, as if to say that Batman is forever destined to these doomed love affairs. Next up, there are two villains the game was surprisingly eager to include, and two others that felt like they were included because someone held a gun to Rocksteady's head. Firstly, Mad Hatter and Firefly. I love me some Hatter, but I have no idea why he's in this game, other than Rocksteady loving him too. He gets to lead Batman down one last trippy level that serves as a little homage to the history of the Arkham series. It's a cute, but very surface level trip down memory lane. 
And then there's Firefly, who makes his Rocksteady debut after first appearing in Origins, one of the few direct references to that prequel. Firefly's missions are even more surface level than Hatter's. However, his relevance to Batman's legacy comes in a companion mission. Fire Chief Underhill is a man willing to break the law to help his people. He means well, but is ultimately a criminal. This is a bizarre subplot, unless you consider Underhill as an analog of Bruce Wayne. In a way, Underhill represents what would have happened to Bruce if he hadn't faked his own death. To his people, Underhill is a hero, but to the law, he's still a criminal. Could Bruce Wayne really continue to operate as usual after this game? No way. Underhill is a glimpse at his potential future. Then there's Deathstroke and Hush. The two villains Rocksteady had no clue what to do with. These feel more like wrapping up loose ends than anything really satisfying, but they still serve the overall farewell to the franchise. Hush ties up the major loose end from Arkham City in a way that no one wanted, but at least Rocksteady realized they couldn't just have Hush not be in this game. They gave us some closure. Like Firefly, Deathstroke debuted in Origins, but this is Rocksteady's first crack at the character. On paper, his role is pretty cool. And for the sake of this video, let's leave the conversation on paper because it's the sentiment that counts. Right? Right? Deathstroke takes over for the titular villain in a final act twist, promising a rematch between the toughest son of a bitch who ever tussled with the B-Man. It's been more than 10 years since that fateful duel, the sun's setting over the saloon, and people have gathered in the town square to watch this showdown. Oh, Batman bashed him real good, and he's down for the count. This is just a macho bat moment that shows the big guy still got it, while wrapping up a pseudo-rivalry with Deathstroke. Same as with Hush, I guess it was just nice to see him off. And finally, two of the more sympathetic side villains, Killer Croc and Mr. Freeze. I realize I misspoke earlier, Nightwing and Batman take part in the Killer Croc mission together, but it's much more focused on the villain than their relationship. Here, Killer Croc gets a surprisingly tragic send-off, which is following up another plot element established in Origins, his continuing mutation. Although Croc was introduced into the series as a horror creature, eating hands and living in the sewers, this finale humanizes Waylon Jones as the victim of otherism and torture. It doesn't excuse his crimes, and we still need to cave his head in, but it's a nice layer that Rocksteady didn't need to add. Since he's one of the OG eight Arkham villains, it was good seeing him one last time, and even Aaron Cash gets some closure. Then there's Mr. Freeze. Much like how Rocksteady ended the unendable Batman story, they did the same for this villain. He was a great addition to Arkham City with a fantastic DLC in Arkham Origins, but I appreciate his final appearance in Night the most. He's the only character who truly gets to ride off into the sunset, although it's bittersweet. Nora is unfrozen and finally able to speak to the man her husband has become. She pleads with him to stop destroying himself and to let her live. Freeze accepts that after all his work, he can never achieve his life's purpose, and embraces his wife for the few remaining days they have left. This is the last Mr. Freeze story. It's the perfect way to send off this sympathetic villain whose drive has always echoed Batman's own. That covers all the side missions, all the allies and villains, except for one. The Joker. This game is as focused on Joker's legacy as it is on Batman's, since they're so intertwined. The titular villain of the game is a bastardized offspring of Batman and Joker. Jason is the byproduct of Batman's teachings, and over a year of torture and brainwashing by the Joker. The main arc that Batman goes on is dealing with his fear of becoming exactly like the Clown Prince, a sadistic killing machine, destroying everything he's accomplished and every relationship he's built. His journey is a true dive into madness, which is constantly experienced from the early hours of the game when Joker first re-emerges, where he's then a continuous presence throughout the open world, side missions, and main plot, which was the perfect way to continue to explore the theme of insanity that is at the heart of Rocksteady's core, Arkham, 
Trilogy. This is a series that deals with madness, and the key question in every game has been whether or not Batman will succumb or beat it back. That's what Scarecrow's threat represents, a final test. Can Bruce Wayne make it through his crusade as Batman without breaking, or will he crumble to madness, to the Joker, and destroy his legacy. At every turn, this game proves that Batman will always overcome the corrupting insanity represented by the Joker, and even pull others back from the brink. Joker drove Jason Todd mad in Arkham Asylum, just like he tried to do years later with Batman. However, the Joker didn't succeed then, and now that Jason's back, Batman is able to break through to him, a perfect embodiment of the strength of Batman's legacy over the Joker's. But of course, the game culminates with the Joker temporarily taking over Batman's personality, and this is where the discussion of legacy really comes to the forefront. Joker, or rather Batman's hallucination of Joker, is obsessed with his legacy. Once he's injected with fear toxin, he experiences hallucinations of how the world reacted to his death. They barely noticed. Vision after vision torments the Joker. The idea that his grave is overgrown by weeds, that no one but Harley attended his funeral, that his exploits have fallen out of Gotham's collective memory, make him furious and afraid. Joker stands alone in a field of Batman statues, unable to destroy the legacy that has been carved in stone no matter how hard he tries. Then, he is beaten back into the recesses of Batman's mind, locked away in the dark, never to be revered or remembered. The Joker's legacy is harmful and dangerous. It's not something people will cherish and hold on to, because it offered no hope for a better tomorrow. Although the Batman died on Halloween, his legend will always live on. He overcame every trial that was thrown at him, proved that there was hope worth fighting for, raised up an entire generation to believe in his mission, then died a hero. Batman Arkham Knight isn't perfect, but it delivers a captivating send-off to an iconic character which is built into every minute element of the game, and I'll always respect how they chose to end the Arkham series. Welp, that's my spiel. What do you think? Is Arkham Knight a good finale for the series? Do you think anything could have been done differently? Also, for anyone who cares, work on my Arkham Origins 3 video starts today. It's gonna take a few weeks, but that will be my next video. So, until then, take care.